Thank you. I want to thank uh, Bob and the whole group here. Uh, you guys are healers in my mind. You're trying to heal the body. One of the things that you're going to see in this presentation is the thing I care about is trying to heal the land because I think the land and the body go together and a lot of the problems that you guys deal with on a daily basis I think can be attributed to some of the things that happen in agriculture. Uh, we are about ready to launch into a whole new world of industrial hemp agriculture. Yeah, I, it, I, it looks to me like it's going to follow the same path as corn. And so we got to think about that. Uh, if we're happy about corn, then we shouldn't have any problem with where, where hemp is going. So what I want to do is just sort of focus on that. I'll also touch about on some of the technical things I know you guys want to talk about is sort of genetics and a lot of all those other things when I get to the end of my presentation. But first of all, um, I bought a farm in 2012, okay, and this farm um, is in a valley that is close to the Four Corner region, next to where the Anasazi um, area is, and uh, I'm right below the Chimney Rock Monument, and this land is very spiritual and incredibly special. In 12,000 BC, paleo hunters roamed through this valley. Um, by 1500 BC, they had been transitioning to agriculture and started uh, growing actually a plant called Teosente. Um, by 1050 AD there became a civilization that, uh, that settled there and uh, they noticed that there were a lunar event. It was sort of a lunar standstill. The moon would rise and then it would shudder in between the two rock spires. And so a group of people occupied the monument. There's probably a couple of dozen of them. And the research shows that there's probably, oh, 40, 50 people in the valley that I'm in, and they took care of the people up on the, on the mountain. And that basically was an extension of Chaco Canyon civilization, and it demonstrated their power. And so it's a really special place. I find arrowheads and pottery all of the time, and I realize that, you know, that was the place where a lot of agriculture started in, um, you know, in our country. Um, by 1125, there was a 400-year drought that just started. And so soon after that, um, by 1250, almost all of the civilizations in the southwest area had collapsed uh, due to the inability to grow food and warring factions and all kinds of other things. So there's a cautionary tale about we've sort of been here before in a way, and we need to sort of think about things. I mean, I, I have to take water from the river every day so I know how hard it is and I can only imagine how hard it was for them and so I'm going to talk about some of these basic issues about agriculture and farming. So before I get there I just want to say that there are challenges in farming and there's really two kinds of challenges. There is one kind of challenge which is you have a problem okay and you can solve a problem because there's usually an answer but then there is another kind of challenge and it's called a predicament. A predicament you can't solve. A predicament you adapt to. You, you have to find a way to live with it. And so I'm going to sort of make a case that we have some major predicaments in front of us. This was Biosphere 2, started in 1991-93, as you recall. A lot of people think it was a failure. Uh, we discovered a lot, but I don't think we learned much. Um, one of the things is, this three-acre compound, as soon as the eight humans um, occupied the compound, they were supposed to be in there for two years, and oxygen levels started to drop, CO2 levels started to go up, and they started to realize that all of their planning, which was really great planning, and $180 million, it was really difficult to replicate the eco ecological services that we get for free, because we don't understand them. And so to spend that kind of money in order for eight, for eight human beings to live for two years, this sort of tells you a lot of things. Soon, they, did, they were successful producing their own food. Towards the end, they were malnourished, and they were dipping into their emergency food. So they definitely couldn't have gone any longer than two years. They had introduced 25 species of invertebrates. 19 of them died within the first year. The pollinators in particular, they had to hand pollinate their food. So then they noticed in this ocean area that they had, they started seeing ocean acidification. It became more and more acidic, the, the water did. 
And so these were sort of harbingers of things that are sort of happening to us today. And it sort of tells us that you just can't throw money at this and solve the problem. There is some, that we are facing some predicaments that we really do need to think about. So the solutions for them was basically, well, we'll just pump, we'll air condition the space. So they spent $600,000 a year to air condition the space. They pumped in uh, uh, oxygen in order to, uh, you know, uh, negate the oxygen problem, which, by the way, was really the oxygen and the carbon dioxide was being absorbed by the concrete in the foundation and turning into, and, and, and sucking the oxygen basically out of, out of the atmosphere in there. So, I mean, these are things, these unintended consequences that it just shows you how complex the systems are and how difficult it is. They added biomass in order to grow food. They didn't expect the CO2 to be generated, so much CO2 as, as the uh, carbon was being oxidized and breaking down. Again, sort of telling us something is going to happen if you do the same thing, but you do it at a larger scale. Eventually, they had to abandon the experiment. So I call this, we are living in biosphere three, okay? And we're doing this at a planetary scale. We're doing the, sort of the same thing. And um, actually, I don't know how many of you know Albert Bartlett or knew of him, but I mean, the, I was lucky enough to sit in on one of his classes. He was a physics professor here, and what he said was, the greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function, okay? And this really made a big difference on me, and so, you know, I started studying this stuff. I, I'm an ex-supply chain guy, and it's my job to go look for problems. It was my job to anticipate problems and not let bad things happen because they were really expensive. Um, so this is world population. World population only grew between 2% and 1.2% over all this period of time. And look what happens at the end. I mean, at the end, the numbers get really, really big and they get really big fast. And so he saw that. And these same trends are happening again, whether it's the amount of oil that we use and produce, it is happening with the amount of money and debt that we're creating, we're up to now $237 trillion in the world of debt, okay? And it is growing at an, at an exponential rate. And so these are just sort of, I think these are predicaments that we are in. And if you look at some of the things that are happening more, more closely, um, you know, one of the things that you'll see is the fossil fuels that we use to create this whole society and that we are going to use to power this new industrial hemp agriculture system, these are fossil fuels, took millions of years to get there and we're going to burn them up in 200 years. And so, I mean, the peak oil thing, you might believe it or you might not believe it, but it looks, the data looks like we're getting to the bottom of the barrel. Uh, when we are fracking um, in order to get oil, it might be a, um, a miraculous thing. On the other hand, uh, every one of those, those uh, wells depleted a rate of 80% in three years. You have to replace 40% of the wells every year just to stay even. So it tells us we're getting to the bottom of the barrel. Now, it is producing a lot of oil, and I think that's great, and we need it. But it's telling us something. Um, world phosphorus will face industrial agriculture, OK? We have already passed peak phosphorus. How many years left of it, this stuff? We don't know. Some people say 7, 10, might be 20, but it is in a lifetime. <coughs> okay, and then world resources, including water, fish, everything. Okay, so now I'm just going to have to fly through some pictures of my farm. And I, this is an important one I just want to show you. And that is that in every barrel of oil, there's 11.3 years of human labor. In my particular farm, that's 75. I use 2,200 uh, gallons of diesel a year. That is, I consume 75 barrels of oil a year. If I paid 11.3 people $24,000 a year, that's $271,000. I only paid $4,800 for the oil. I could not farm without oil, OK? Or at least I could not farm this way. So it tells us it's super, super important that we understand what we're using, how fast we're using, and what we're going to use it for. This is my land um, when I got it. Um, there was a lot of soil erosion problems. I have now switched over to no-till, so I do this to preserve the microbiology in the soil, which is 
super important. The reason why it is super important is because we actually don't need fertilizer. No one fertilizes for us. They do quite well on their own. It is because the microbiology in the, in the soil feeds the plant. The plant tells the microbiology or the microbiome what it needs. Okay? But every time we plow the ground, we kill half of it. All of the fungi die. All of the species that rely on that part of the food chain, food web, die along with it. We have to supply fertilizer from that moment on. And we have to supply more and more fertilizer because the soil s slowly dies. So we, re we are losing, we've already lost a half, half the amount of topsoil that we have. And at the rate that we're losing it, it's 100 times greater than the rate which is being created. Uh, we, get, we don't have a, a, 100 years at maybe at the tops. So one of the things that we're doing at my farm is trying to figure out how to do more with less. And this is passive solar greenhouses that, that we use. Um, so inside of our greenhouses, um, we control the light. We control the temperature. Uh, we can get four to six greenhouse turns a year. We use LED lights for most of the grow instead of HPS lights. HPS lights take a lot of energy, but they are required for flowering. Okay, so our greenhouse will look like this if you have one that is healthy. Um, and so what we've had to do is to really understand what does the plant need and how, how it actually can work. So uh, other things that we do is um, use wood boilers for backup. We use solar thermal in order to heat these, these greenhouses. And we also use PV in order to, to run them. So where we are now is uh, we are not a volume hemp uh, producer. Uh, there's a lot of guys that are getting into hemp, and I'd say look, look at your numbers very carefully before you jump in. This is now it off into a larger scale. We are past the, I believe, the local farm level. We are moving into the plantation level, and next it will be industrial level. So be very, very careful about knowing what you are getting into before you jump into this. I have switched my whole farm over to feminized seed production, so we are doing um, feminized seed of high CBD genetics and we're also targeting different micro or different cannabinoids and terpenes because we know that when you guys are done studying CBD and THC that you're going to start saying okay now there is another 104 I would like to know about okay and where can I get those and can I get them reliably repeatedly and at the quality that I expect so we're sort of passing the CBD phase and we are focusing on those other minor cannabinoids and terpenes. So with that, that's it. I will be happy to answer any questions.